So uh, with that said, I'm going to do a very brief intro. Uh, this was actually requested by Rafe. Uh, and we really appreciate that, Rafe, because I, I, I think this was necessary um, to just sort of do a deep dive on Antarctica. Um, and a lot of the focus, although not all of it today, is going to be on um, sea level rise. And so one of the things that we were speaking about in particular at the meeting in uh, Bonn last June, so really just a few weeks ago, is that in AR6 Working Group 1, there was this dotted line that was rather confusedly for um, policymakers titled low likelihood high impact. It was called that simply not because the IPCC authors thought it was necessarily low likelihood, but as Rob in particular knows very well, it was based on just really two studies, but two studies that they thought were well enough done uh, and significant enough that they wanted to include this dotted line. And really since then, and of course that uh, uh, paper period that they could take in the literature closed in January of 2021, what has happened is that that dotted line is, you could say, becoming more and more solid. This is one of those studies that is really showing in a very elegant way. This is Park et al. And we had a presentation, of course, from uh, Park several months ago after his paper came out, uh, which really only showed that SSP1, so very low emissions, where you have temperatures peaking, at around 1.6 and then leveling off avoids a long-term acceleration or continuation of sea level rise. And you know, part of that story is that SSP2, uh, which is a 1.8, the, the line is still going up. It's just not as dramatic. And again, especially from Antarctica. And so this is why we're really looking at um, a very low emissions level as the most important. I'm not gonna you know, click through here because I really wanna give more time to the scientists to um, speak. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we're going to start with uh, the paleo record uh, because that's really where everything begins. Julie is joining us from a conference in Italy. Thank you for taking time out of the conference and uh, please. Okay, I'm... Um still disabled, so if Amy could um, enable my screen. You should be a co-host, but uh, no, you're not. We'll go ahead and do that right now. Okay, okay. you should be able to share now. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments about uh, sea level rise. There's a fantastic um, program going on here. Um, on Monday, we'll update uh, all day people talking about sea level. So um, I just want to uh, make a point here that those of us who are um, studying sea level um, go to deposits like this. This is Andrea Dutton looking at the last interglacial shoreline. And I want to introduce this concept of remembering forward, the idea that we're rem remembering the past, but looking forward. And so if, if the idea of paleoclimate isn't clear to you, the idea of remembering forward um, really should hit home in terms of how we're gonna use these data. So we have these, uh, these shorelines. I was on a field trip just this last week seeing shorelines in Southern Italy um, uh, that dated to the last interglacial. Um, so, um, so let's think about what the world was like the last time the, um, the uh, PCO2 was as high as it is today. If we look back to the Pliocene, uh, global temperatures were about three degrees above present. And the world looked like this at that time. Um, there was a little bit of ice in Northwest uh, and Western Greenland, a little bit in Southern Alaska, but um, we had a very different world at that time. And um, there are a number of sites that where we can document, in, in fact, these extremely, what seem like extremely warm temperatures. The paleoclimate community is getting really good at reconstructing what climate was like from a terrestrial point of view, as you see in these images here, um, but also thinking about sea level. And so there are a fantastic set of caves here, west of Italy in Majorca, where they've been able to document 
um, Pliocene sea level in the range of 16 to 23 meters um, in the past. Uh, that, that really speak to the fact that something had to have, have melted. And this paper is complemented by other work, for example, in New Zealand, where they also have a mean sea level roughly of um, 16 meters. But in this particular record, you can see here, this is just showing you from a period of cross parts of the Pliocene, the amplitude of sea level, giving you some idea of the size of the ice sheets, but again, consistent with um, a, a sea level uh, somewhat in that range. So paleoclimate scientists like myself and the ones that are here from Pale Sea, the pages um, past sea level group that are talking on Monday, have come up with these kind of uh, relationships between temperature and relative sea level. And we can see that every each degree matters. Whether here we are, we've already surpassed, uh, of course, one degree, we're heading toward 1.5, we're heading to the last interglacial. But if we go on to um, temperatures that are global temperatures of two to three degrees, we're looking at, at sea level as, as high as in the Pliocene, uh, plus 20 meters or so. And of course, uh, beyond that, if we, and I have to say that by, uh, it's only gonna be 10 years from now, we're gonna be approaching 450 ppm at the rate we're going. Um, uh, we don't want to get any higher because the higher the CO2 goes, the warmer it gets, the higher the sea level will go. So as we see from this diagram, this is our, of course, our normal range of glacial interglacial change. And of course, where we're at is in that very far right-hand curve. I just checked last night, we're up at 420 ppm. So that normal range, we far exceeded that and we can't get allow the earth to get any warmer without serious consequences in that little box right there. And so this is uh, one of Andrea Dutton's uh, figures that we modified here. And on the left-hand side, this shows what the world was like, um, um, you know, over a hundred years ago, we've, but now we have CO2 up at 400 ppm. And in the little blue lines below, the blue, blue columns show you in red, what we think may have melted. And this is being revised all of the time as, as you'll hear from the ice sheet people um, uh, as to what melted when. And so if we look back to um, say the last interglacial, um, we can think about uh, maybe large parts of Greenland and much of West Antarctica uh, disintegrating. If we look at going into one and a half degrees or more, um, sea level could be even higher. This is uh, what we think for about MIS stage 11, about 400,000 years ago. And on the right-hand side, it's, it's if, if we lose all of Greenland, which is could happen uh, within a thousand years at, at, if we don't do anything about uh, CO2 um, and, and elsewhere in West Antarctica, maybe parts of East Antarctica, we could be looking at potential sea level rise over the coming millennia. Uh, uh, and even over centuries that are starting to approach an equilibrium that would be in the excess of 16 meters. So, um, so these, this is where this diagram here. Uh, if, if, you, if you could speed up because we have so many speakers, so. Yes, yes, I, I yeah. think the point being is that um, we are um, in the Pliocene. This is a reconstruction of what Northern Greenland looked like 2 million years ago. Uh, a time when the ice sheet collapsed, it gives you an idea that Greenland can be green uh, as it was in the past. And so we're really approaching um, a critical point in um, the climate that we cannot surpass anymore. So as, as Pam will tell you, and all of us will tell you, 1.5 degrees is still too warm. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. <laughs> Sorry to rush you, it's just that we've no got- problem. Axel's about to start. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, we're actually doing this almost in order of, of papers often going forward. So Rob, please uh, take it away. Okay, thanks, Pam. As I um, just start up a couple of PowerPoint slides, I have this fancy new backdrop here behind me, and I just want, want everyone um, involved in Arctic 21 and other folks to know that the climate in cryosphere, which is a core project of the World Climate Research Program under the auspices of the WMO, um, has a new project office. And that project office is in Amherst at the University of Massachusetts, proudly uh, myself and Ray Bradley 
managed to uh, convince NSF and NASA that the Click needed support. Um, there were about three years where Click really didn't have a home. So this is a really wonderful thing, and we're looking forward to more interaction, Pam, with you, ICCI, with Arctic 21, and so forth. Okay, so now just getting into a few minutes of science that might spark some conversation for later. Uh, just to kick things off, because a, you know a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, you know, this is still, it's surprising to Earth scientists, I think, to just be reminded as to the scale of the Antarctic system. You know, roughly 58 meters of equivalent sea level is locked up in that ice sheet. It's an enormous system, and obviously even a, a small change in that system has the potential to have really um, dramatic impact across the globe. So a lot of that ice, it's flowing from the interior of the continent out toward the ocean, it's, it's slowed and supported structurally by floating extensions of the ice sheet that we call ice shelves. Anything that you see in these um, yellow and orange colors are these floating ice shelves. It, it's part of the ice sheet, but this is ice that is actually not sitting on the bedrock. And these ice shelves play an incredibly important role in that in places where they grind along maybe features on the seafloor or along the edges of embayments or fjords, those floating ice shelves actually provide this support, we call it buttressing, that slows the flow of the ice sheet toward the ocean. So they play an, a pivotal role in essentially, uh, you could think of them as having the potential to trigger a tipping point in the Antarctic system because these ice shelves are thinning in many places today. They're being warmed, and melted from below from their contact with the ocean. And if we start to see more summer temperatures that begin to exceed freezing, where we start to get some meltwater on the surface of these ice shelves, they could actually be impacted um, by being broken up by meltwater getting into crevasses and, and wedging apart these um, ice shelves. We call that hydrofracturing. So the ice shelves are really a, a key part of the future Antarctic story. Now, um, these are a couple of really nice images of two glaciers, big glacier systems in Greenland. The one on the left is called Helheim Glacier. That's in Southeast Greenland or East Greenland. And in West Greenland on the right, we have the Jakobshavn Glacier. Jakobshavn, that figure on the right, you can see the glacier is flowing from the top right corner of that photo toward the bottom left. It's one of the fastest major um, outlet glaciers in the world. The ice in the glacier itself is about a thousand meters thick. It's a kilometer thick glacier. What's happening today is uh, back in roughly in the 1990s or so, Jakobshavn lost the bulk of its ice shelf, its supporting ice shelf. The, the glaciers accelerated, it began to flow faster toward the ocean, but it also began to produce icebergs faster. And today, you know, if we were to look over the last decade or so, the rate that icebergs are being produced, the breaking off at the edge of that glacier is actually exceeding the very fast flow of the glacier toward the sea. So the glacier itself is beginning to back up into the interior of the Greenland ice sheet. So these are processes. You know, ice has these, it kind of has a dual personality. It flows toward the ocean under its own weight, under relatively low stress. But if the stresses in the ice become high enough, the ice can actually behave as a brittle material and fracture and break. Now, these breaking processes, the fracture, um, are processes that have not really traditionally been included in the kinds of ice sheet models that we use for future projections of sea level rise. And I just want, if you have some interest in, in, in learning more about this, there's some very, I think, um, digestible guidance about these ice sheet processes that were spelled out um, in the IPCC SROC report and some nice boxes that are very user friendly that I think will illustrate these processes that I'm talking about. So right now I'm really getting you, giving you some attention that there are some things that we observe in Greenland happening today that aren't necessarily well represented in the models that we use to predict the future. In, a concern is that if these processes that we see happening in Greenland today begin to appear and begin to operate in much bigger glacier systems in Antarctica, that Antarctica could start to um, 
produce very rapid rates of sea level rise. So as Pam at the beginning of today's presentations um, mentioned, um, really only one continental scale ice sheet model to date has tried to incorporate these processes like these types of um, calving behavior that we see in Greenland in an Antarctic ice sheet model. And when we added these brittle processes to this ice sheet model, two things happened. The model did a better job of simulating past sea level changes like the ones that Julie just spoke about. And the second thing that happened was the projected potential rise in global sea level caused by Antarctica went essentially through the roof, much, much higher. And this is an example. So here are some models. This, this, this black line down here at the bottom of this image is my group's ice sheet model without these brittle, brittle processes engaged. And these are projections under high emissions. The, the same projection, this is RCP 8.5, and here's the same model with these brittle processes included. Completely different sea level outcome. This is now just, you know, as Pam noted, the IPCC, because this is just one model that has this included, um, cannot really consider this a result that has medium confidence that they would be able to insert within a probabilistic projection of future sea level rise. And this is what contributed in part to that dashed red line that, that Pam spoke to. Um, I'm just going to sort of conclude as to reminding everyone, okay, under very high emissions, we include these processes and we can generate really um, quite remarkable uh, rates and magnitudes of sea level rise in future um, centuries. But we take the same model now and we can explore how much warming triggers these processes in a few, few places that could actually begin to push rates of sea level rise that would maybe push some um, coastal cities, for example, beyond the limits of adaptation. And what we found was that even with these new processes included in the ice sheet model, um, 1.5 degrees of warming over this century, the rate of sea level rise, which is this red curve, really kind of just stays the same as it is roughly today. Con the contribution to Antarctica doesn't really go through the roof if, as long as the, um, we're able to stay within that 1.5 degrees over the next century. This is the same kind of simulation exploring um, what if we actually make it to two degrees by the year 2100, and then we basically level out. And again, you know, we're still in a relatively safe zone, we think maybe at about two degrees, but you can see that a little, little something is beginning to happen at two degrees relative to 1.5. When we go to three degrees, something maybe a little bit more in line with the um, current NDCs, um, once we get to around 2060, 2070, essentially all hell breaks loose, where we're beginning to lose some of those critical buttressing ice shelves. We get faster flow of some of the major Antarctic outlet glaciers and this calving process, like we see in Greenland, begins to kick in. And there's a, a massive acceleration in the pace of sea level contribution from Antarctica. So the, the, thank, the take thanks home- Thanks so much, Rob. We're, we're gonna have the, to jump to the next one. I think that's a good place to- No, it's a good place to start uh, or to, to, to move to on, jump Pam, but to, just- to Chris Stokes, yeah. Yeah, we um, the the really key thing is that once this kicks in in this bottom left plot, it we it's irreversible. If we reduce CO two very quickly, it's irreversible. So again, the take home message is that um, any kind of overshoot beyond two degrees is getting us into the danger zone. Yeah. Thanks so much. So Chris. I'm sure you're here to give us more great news, right? Yeah, sadly not. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I think one of the points that I, I want to make actually on uh, Pam's comment there is that this is a really rapidly moving field. And, um, you know, the more we find out year on year, unfortunately, the kind of worse it gets. Um, I'm just gonna spend a few slides actually on um, a part of Antarctica called the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. We tend to, uh, split Antarctica into the, the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet and the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. And the vast majority of research has been done on the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, which we think has been out of balance now for two or three decades and is contributing to sea level rise. 
And we've often thought of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, which is far larger, stores around 52 meters of sea level equivalent. Um, we've often thought traditionally that it's a much more kind of stable ice sheet. So the, the paradigm over the last few decades has probably been that it's much less vulnerable to warming than West Antarctica or indeed the Greenland ice sheet, which Rob's also mentioned. In fact, I was, I was distracted in, in some older literature um, yesterday and I, I discovered a paper written um, in 94 suggesting that the East Antarctic ice sheet was, would be stable unless warming reached 16 degrees C. Now, there were, that was a very simple model. It was one of the early models. There were lots of processes missing, but it, I think it's just a nice example of how quickly things move in this field, because as recently as 2020, another paper came out suggesting that the East Antarctic ice sheet uh, maybe had a, a threshold of about six degrees of warming before we were to see a response. But that paper did highlight that there are parts of East Antarctica that share characteristics with the West and might be particularly vulnerable. So I've, just, just to caveat, everything I'm going to say today is about the East Antarctic ice sheet, not necessarily the West. And, and so what I mean by these marine-based sectors um, are these parts of the ice sheet bed in Antarctica where the bed elevation, the, the land, if you like, on which the ice sheet rests is well below sea level. So these blue areas, you can see most of West Antarctica, most of that ice sheet sits on a bed below sea level, and it makes it vulnerable to some of those instabilities that Rob's just talked about. But there are also uh, at least three large regions of East Antarctica that also share those kind of characteristics. Um, there's the Recovery Subglacial Basin, the Aurora Subglacial Basin, and, and the Wilkes Subglacial Basin. And we know, interestingly, that one of these, in particular, in East Antarctica has been losing mass. So this area here, uh, known as Wilkes Land, we think has been losing mass now um, for at least two decades, possibly earlier, based on satellite measurements. So it seems that we're starting to see an emerging sign of mass loss in this once assumed stabilized sheet, um, happening in a very similar way to West Antarctica. And as Rob said, and this is actually some of his model results here, which I've um, stolen for this presentation, the paleo record shows clearly that when you force these ice sheet models with atmospheric temperatures that are not too much higher than today, we get much higher sea levels, as Julie mentioned, and we get multiple uh, meters of sea level from East Antarctica, and it tends to be from these three marine basins. So what we're doing at the moment is a lot of research looking at the sensitivity of these basins to, in particular, ocean changes. So we kind of have known about this, and I just want to highlight in, in just a few minutes a few highlights of work that's really been um, uncovered since the IPCC report. One of those is that the ocean temperatures um, off Wilkes Land, off this Aurora Subglacial Basin here, have uh, recently been shown to have warmed quite dramatically over the last couple of decades. So that will be consistent with the signal of mass loss that we see. And actually, there was a, a paper from a couple of years ago showing that mass loss in Wilkes Land in this sector of East Antarctica is now 10 times higher than it was in the early 2000s. So this is really worrying because I think we're starting to see emerging signs of instability in the East Antarctic ice sheet. Some of the work we've been doing um, recently, um, this is an example, Vanderford Glacier in East Antarctica, it's in Wilkesland. There was an Australian cruise actually took a ship. So this year, looking at the ocean floor here, and there's a very deep canyon in blue that's capable of carrying warm waters towards the terminus of this glacier. And actually, we've measured the, the grounding line retreat, the kind of the point at which this glacier begins to float. And it's been retreating at about 770 metres per year. That actually makes it the third fastest grounding line retreat anywhere in Antarctica, not just East Antarctica, and it coincides with recent measurements of the highest water temperatures anywhere off East Antarctica. And you may have heard about Thwaites Glacier or the Doomsday Glacier in West Antarctica, but it's only just behind that in terms of the, the severity or the extreme rates of retreat here. So I think we're fairly confident now that the same processes that we've observed over the last few decades in West Antarctica, destabilizing that ice sheet are just beginning, we think, to occur in parts of East Antarctica. There's also a growing body of evidence that some of these marine basins in East Antarctica lost mass during the last interglacial. So the last interglacial, Julie's talked about this, it was maybe 1.5 degrees um, warmer than pre-industrial. So, you know, something we might be looking at in the next few decades. 
And there's been a clutch of papers coming out showing that this marine basin, the Wilson Glacial Basin, responded during the last interglacial. This is very new because we, we never thought East Antarctica necessarily contributed to higher sea levels during the last interglacial. We tended to assume it was Greenland and West Antarctica, maybe some work, including some of Rob's work, suggesting it could have been East Antarctica, but there's now growing evidence. And there was a paper that even came out last week showing that you, know, you kind of need additional contributions to sea level from other Antarctic sources. What they mean there is not West Antarctica, but the East Antarctica ice sheet as well, to explain those higher sea levels during the last interglacial. So we've got current observations showing that this ice sheet is very sensitive to present day ocean warming. And we've got some additional evidence from the paleo record, particularly the last interglacial about 125,000 years ago, that suggested that the East Antarctic ice sheet was sensitive. Um, and that this is a bit of a game changer really, I think in this accumulation of evidence. Um, we recently reviewed some of the projections. And again, I can't emphasize enough that this is just the East Antarctic ice sheet. But what we showed here was that if warming continues and high emissions, then this ice sheet will start to contribute several meters to sea level, maybe one to three meters by 2300, two to five meters by 2500. But as Rob said, if the Paris Agreement to limit warming to well below two degrees C is satisfied, then the East Antarctic ice sheet would remain below half a meter. Okay, so there's a really important threshold here. And I think the really the take home message from this talk, if we just go back over the last two decades, we thought that this ice sheet would be immune to any kind of response, you know, unless temperatures got above 16 degrees, then it came down to six degrees. Now, there's been a couple of papers come out suggesting that the minimum threshold that this ice sheet could start to respond, this once stable ice sheet could start to respond with as little as two degrees of warming. And there's actually, I said I wasn't going to talk about West Antarctica, but there's a couple of really interesting papers in, in, in review at the moment suggesting that the West Antarctic ice sheet may already have tipped over into some kind of irreversible loss. Or even if it hasn't, present day climate forcing would be enough if it was sustained over the next few decades to tip it into irreversible retreat, much as Rob said. So I'll finish there. Thanks, Pam. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and relevant to some of the things that Chris talked about, we're going to have a talk by Martin Siegert, who many of you know, um, but we're going to jump to uh, James Kirkham, who recently joined ICCI as a, a chief science advisor to uh, AMI, the Ambition on Melting Ice group. Uh, Martin will actually be talking probably about something in press that is about extreme weather in Antarctica, but now we're going to hear a bit about Antarctic sea ice. So please take it away, James. Okay, thank you, Pam. I hope you can all see my screen. So um, I recently returned from a three-month expedition in Antarctica, and I wanted to give you a very brief summary of some of the things I saw there. Not the slides. Okay, so about five months ago, on the 21st of February, I woke up, and as I often do in the morning, I went for a walk. But this was no ordinary day. I was in Antarctica, and whilst that was certainly special, there was another reason why this day would be exceptional. Now, the 21st of February was the day when Antarctic sea ice reached its lowest extent since our records began. This was my view just over a thousand miles from the South Pole. Now, you might think that, well, he must have been hundreds of kilometers away from the ice sheet to have seen this, but no, here's our ship, very close to the Antarctic ice sheet. So close, in fact, that you can see it in the top right of this image flowing down into the ocean. You can see in this map here, how much sea ice was left in white compared to the long-term average shown as this green line. So you can see that it's dramatically reduced. So this year, 2023, will get out in history as the year when you did not need an icebreaker to work in Antarctica. And to see how this vast amount of unfrozen ocean was affecting the main ice sheet, we flew along the face of the ice in a helicopter and we observed three things. So first, the frozen ocean normally resists the flow of the main ice sheet as it pushes towards the sea and protects the ice from damaging waves. 
Without it, there's simply less resistance and the ice crumbles more easily into the sea, which will elevate rates of sea level rise. Secondly, that huge expanse of dark open water that you can see in this picture is soaking up all of the sunlight and heat that would usually be reflected back off the frozen ocean and back into space. This will lead to warmer ocean waters and accordingly faster rates of melting of the main ice sheet that it's in contact with. Thirdly, the most striking realization that we had on the flight was that we actually hadn't seen any animals from the ship in months. Now, normally Antarctica sparkles with life, but without any sea ice to rest on, the penguins and the seals living in this area had been forced to gather on any ice they could find. In this case, the small black dots that you can see in this picture in the crack between the ice sheet on the left and a giant new iceberg on the right are seals that have desperately crawled up into this chasm where only a small amount of sea ice remained. Now, this huge reduction in Antarctic sea ice has had catastrophic impacts for the breeding of emperor penguins. A new study that hasn't come out yet, but is about to come out in a few weeks' time, shows us just how bad the loss of this sea ice is for these iconic creatures. So these birds rely on platforms of sea ice between April and December to breed. And if the ice breaks up early, the chicks will simply fall into the water and freeze and drown. And before this year broke it, last year, 2022, was the lowest spring sea ice extent on record, and it led to the highest rates of breeding failure ever recorded. In some regions, 80% of penguin colonies suffered total breeding failure. And this year's sea ice extent is shaping up to be even worse than last year. So it's highly likely that the population of emperor penguins is going to take another massive hit. So the images I've shown you so far in this presentation were taken in the Antarctic summer. Now, Antarctic sea ice normally regrows in the winter, but as we continue to watch this trend play out, we can see that Antarctic sea ice has not recovered to normal levels. Currently, it's about 1 million square miles below average for this time of year. So that's equivalent to a piece of ice or ice missing from Antarctica that's four times the size of Texas. That's exceptionally low. And because we're still watching this alarming trend play out, scientists are going to need some more time to fully understand these changes. But what is certain is that 2023 is offering a window into the future of what the Antarctic ice sheet, its surrounding oceans, and the life that depends on them will look like if we continue to push our climate to ever warmer levels. We need greater ambition and greater action to radically cut emissions now in order to stop this future from becoming a reality. Thank you for listening. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, James. And I should note that uh, James volunteered to do this despite not being an Arctic and, and a sea ice expert in any way. And so we really appreciate this. That's right. That's just a first hand observations from the field. Exactly. Uh, and our next speaker is very much an expert. This is Sean Hendley, who is going to speak to um, especially Southern Ocean acidification, which really does not get enough uh, attention. And so, Sean, please take it away. Thank you, Pam. And uh, hopefully you can see my screen in full view. Uh, so thank you, James, for your exceptional talk. My birthday is actually the 21st of February, so it was a, a strange way to celebrate this year. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about ocean acidification in the Southern Ocean. Now, this is driven, oops, uh, there we go. This is driven by the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So I think we all know that the uh, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide has increased due to human activity. Uh, but what is perhaps less well known is that this is driving a parallel increase in ocean surface waters. And that's because the ocean is taking up approximately a quarter of the greenhouse gases that we are emitting. But this is causing major problems in the oceans in that they are becoming significantly more acidic. Uh, and as well as lowering the pH that you can see here in light blue, in the darker blue beneath, 
you can see that it's also causing a decrease in the concentration of carbonate ions. And without worrying about the chemistry too much, just remember that these are molecules that organisms need to complete their life cycles. So that is, uh, those are the changes that we've seen over the last 40 years. This new plot that I've just put up shows the projections from the latest IPCC report of how ocean acidification will proceed under different greenhouse gas emissions scenarios. And we can see that in all but the uh, best case scenario of low emissions in the two shades of blue, ocean acidification continues to get much worse over this century and is at its worst in the highest emission scenario. So if we now have a look at what the distribution of ocean acidification will be in 2100, we can see that on the top uh, map here in the high emission scenario, ocean acidification is both widespread and highly intense throughout the polar regions by 2100. Whereas if we follow the low emissions pathway in the, the Paris world by sticking to the Paris Agreement, ocean acidification is much less widespread and much less intense. So why does this matter? Well, the uh, impacts of ocean acidification are many and varied, and they're already observed in many Southern Ocean organisms and throughout ecosystems. So phytoplankton are altered in terms of their growth rates and their species composition. Antarctic krill experience increased levels of physiological stress, reduced reproductive success, and increased mortality. And the Antarctic zooplankton, the pteropod, Limacina helicina, experiences severe shell dissolution and reduced larval survival. So again, reduced reproductive success. And this is obviously important for these particular species, but it's all in, also important for the entire ecosystem. And that's because the phytoplankton and the zooplankton provide the food source for the entire ecosystem. So by influencing these species, ocean acidification is compromising the availability and the nutritional value of these food sources for fish and for higher trophic levels. So this is influencing the way the whole ecosystem functions, as well as the ecosystem services and societal benefits that we derive from the Southern Ocean. The most obvious one being the fisheries targets of Antarctic krill and the larger organisms that rely on krill and pteropods as their food sources. So in terms of the long lasting effects of ocean acidification, this plot shows here what happens for the different emission scenarios if we then stop all emissions at 2100. So it looks at how quickly the Southern Ocean can recover from acidification at different uh, greenhouse gas emissions levels. So in the red line, we can see that the recovery that starts at 2100 starts from a really serious place and does not recover over the hundreds of year timescale shown on this graph. And in fact, it takes tens of thousands of years to recover. So it's essentially permanent for the ocean species experiencing these changes. And at lower uh, emission scenarios, this recovery starts from a less severe place and takes less time to recover, but only by sticking to the Paris Agreement can we really ensure that acidification doesn't get so bad that it is enabled to recover over realistic timescales for the organisms living in the Southern Ocean. So uh, by way of wrapping up, the four key points are that ocean acidification is caused by increasing atmospheric CO2, not temperature itself and the polar oceans are particularly susceptible to this effect. Uh, the impacts of ocean acidification are, are already felt throughout marine food webs and are projected to get much worse and the higher our emissions uh, uh, continue to be, the worse these effects will be 
and the longer the system will take to recover. So if we allow ocean acidification to continue by continuing to emit greenhouse gases, it will become irreversible over thousands of years. So the only solution to ocean acidification in the Southern Ocean and globally is urgent, deep and sustained reductions in our emissions of greenhouse gases. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Really appreciate your joining us today. Um, finally, now we have uh, Dr. Martin Siegert and uh, he is going to be speaking to some very new research into extreme weather on Antarctica. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pam. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, Sean. Nice to see you again. How are you doing? Hi, Bob. Good to see you. It's been a little while. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so Pam's right. This is um, a paper that we've, we've put together um, and should be out in a few weeks. Uh, Pam has a copy of the preprint and she will circulate that to, to everybody after the, the talk. Um, I was asked by someone at the UK Foreign Office um, uh, whether there was any literature on Antarctic extreme events. Um, we know about extreme events um, in other parts of the world, um, flooding, droughts, um, uh, heavy rainfall, you know, all that, those things, and, and the increasing um, scientific methods that are demonstrating attribution um, and liability uh, for companies, for countries, as a consequence of fossil fuel burning to those particular events and the damages that they, uh, that they cause. Um, and that's one of the sort of great areas, I think, of, um, uh, of uh, climate solutions and how to finance it coming through liabilities of, of companies and if it's on their risk register, they'll be wanting to reduce their risks and so potentially investing more and more in, um, in net zero and potentially in, ne uh, in negative emissions as well to reduce liability. So it's an area. And then, of course, anecdotally, there's been a lot of extreme events relatively recently uh, that we've noticed in Antarctica. Um, some of the stunning ones being the sort of 38 degrees above variability, normal variability um uh heat atmospheric heat wave from an atmospheric river that affected east antarctica uh, in winter last year um where where temperatures in central east antarctica should have been like minus 50 and they were closer to minus 10 which was like insane um and huge amounts of snowfall that have happened this summer on the antarctic peninsula um and uh, and of course a very low levels of winter sea ice that are, that are happening right now in Antarctica with no real sign that, uh, uh, as it's in midwinter, that, that it's growing particularly fast at the moment. So it'll be, it'll be very low. And so we, we, me and maybe 20 other people, quite a lot of people, um, put our heads together to try to scope out Antarctic extreme events across a variety of, of different realms and systems um, just to, to get it into the literature, just to get us talking about uh, Antarctic extreme events and, and get us to assess whether th these things are happening um, more regularly, more intensively, and what the attribution of those things are likely to be. And one way to look at attribution isn't, isn't necessarily to say it is definitely caused by, by burning fossil fuels. Another way to look at it is, is to um, consider whether these events are more likely under continued fossil fuel burning. And through that logic, you can determine whether it's likely or not there is an attribution um, to, be, to be thought about. So what I've got is a couple of tables uh, uh, that we've uh, done. I can share my screen, let's try to do that. Uh, there you go. Uh, Sean, I can only see you. Oh, you switch your, yeah. Rob, I can see you. You can just, can you see? Yeah, there you go, perfect. So, so what we've done is um, uh, just tabulated everything as best we can and tried to, there's a lot of information and as ever, you know, lots and lots of details, not on this table there, but we're trying to sort of encapsulate a lot of things. And we asked us a, a few questions. Firstly, what the event was. So you can see the one at the top is the 38 degrees um, heat wave in East Antarctica. We think about the cause of it and we think about the impact of it that it, that it might have had. We then talk about the time scales of these things over how long do they operate? And then we ask a question, will it continue? Is it likely to be 
more intensive, more regular under continued fossil fuel burning. And what we've done in this table and another one, which I'll show in a second, is try to examine a number of different um, Antarctic extreme events from a variety of different uh, places and ask those same questions um, of the, those particular events. So we can talk about the sea ice and the extremely low levels of sea ice that uh, is forming in the winter uh, this year. Um, uh, we can talk about uh, land ice as well and, and, and very unusual levels of surface melting that has been going on recently uh, in East Antarctica, upstream of the grounding lines um, uh, even. Um, uh, we can talk about historical extreme events. Uh, some of these are dynamic, but the switching off of, of ice stream C or CAM ice stream, which would, should be considered as an extreme. We're taking a very holistic view of extreme events, something that happens in Antarctica that is highly unusual, you know, high magnitude, low frequency uh, sort of, of systems. Um, we can talk about um, early Holocene and Black Ice Sheet thinning, for, for example, examine the cause of those of, of it, and then try to understand whether or not it might be likely under future uh, scenarios. Ice shelves, of course, is something that we're considering with uh, Larson A uh, and B, and with our Larson C showing lots of, um, of surface melting and other ice shelves as well, experiencing uh, either mass loss, uh, uh, carving front retreats, or, or even collapse as well. And so we're considering those things. Uh, into the ocean, marine heat waves, 19 marine heat wave events between uh, 2002 and 2018. Um, it's not something I was particularly aware of. Um, Snow, I've mentioned. Uh, marine biology, you know, we talk about Antarctic extreme events, you really can't do an analysis of that sort of thing without considering the near mass extinction of large marine mammals as a consequence of human intervention um, in the early 20th century. So we, we put that in as well. And then terrestrial biology too, with the reduction in um, uh, snow, snow and ice surface, the increase in land surface, the introduction of alien species and, and the colonization of those in, in Antarctica happening very rapidly. Um, uh, as a consequence of, of what is a human intervention, uh, a, a, either through interference with the natural systems or by directly inputting um, pollens and, and spores and things um, in, into the wrong place. So the, the whole thing was done actually relatively quickly. Um, uh, I think the first conversations we had were in the, in the new year, and this paper is about to come out. It's in Frontiers in Environmental Science. That's completely open access and stuff, and it'll be out, I think, in a, in a, just doing a typesetting, be out in a, in a few weeks. But Pam's got the, the preprint. I'm very happy for that to be circulated. I'm really keen that we start talking about Antarctic extreme events um, in, in a lot of international venues, like, for example, COP28, um, but other things as well. The, these are unfortunately surely likely to increase in intensification and, and regularity. And, and we do not need to start thinking about uh, the potential consequences of, of those um, to, to the natural systems. Um, to the biological systems, um, to IG stability, and all those things that many here know, know an awful lot more than I do about, um, but, but understanding um, the consequences of high frequency, sorry, um, high impact low frequency events, I think is something which is a little understudied from the Antarctic perspective. Um, so just to introduce uh, this paper, Pam, that, that, that's it. I'm very really happy to take a few questions and things if, if uh, people want. Thanks. Th thank you so much. I would say, uh... A little understudied is probably quite a uh, an underestimate in terms of the amount that this has been covered. So um, I will say that uh, normally we only go until 5 p.m. I certainly don't want to ask, especially those of you in Europe, uh, to stay very late your time. But if you're able to stay on, please do. If the um, if you could stop sharing your screen, Martin, and we'll just ask all of the uh, speakers to turn on your, uh, thank you, to turn on your cameras and uh, please raise your hands if you have any questions.